Hello, hello, hello. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. So I hope you guys are doing well. So I'm going to give another minute here to officially start because uh, I need to hit that 8 o'clock time slot. Exactly. How you guys doing? Hey, Night Shadow. Um, so I got to get some stuff done today. <laughs> so I need to finish this uh, Z Modeler uh, well here. And then if I have time, I can go over the UV Master features for sure. Hey, Dark and Grim. Hey, Art Zan. Hey, Digital Magic, all the way from Hong Kong. Man, crazy, crazy, crazy. So hope you guys are doing well. I got rid of my collared shirt today, so hopefully you guys won't hear uh, mic noise from all over the place. We got Dr. Pixels from Aruba. <laughs> a little bit of Tony Stark. I need, one time I'm going to come on here and I'm going to have a full Iron Man costume. It's going to happen. I don't know when. Um, need to find some time. <laughs> all right. So we're officially now at the 8 o'clock time slot in uh, California. So uh, we can begin here. So first of all, I got some things I just want to hit on and cover quick. So to start off, if you guys have not upgraded to ZBrush 2020, it is a free upgrade. In addition to this, we have also released uh, two patches now for 2020, and this is uh, including ZBrush Core as well. Uh, so if you had 2020.1 installed and you launched it, it should tell you like, hey, there's an update, go and download it. Um, if it has not, and you have not heard about this yet, uh, go, to, uh, go to ZBrush Central, and then on the top row gallery um, here, there will be a little icon for ZBrush 2020.1. It'll take you to this thread. And then in here, you can see uh, what was fixed. So there was a big one that was fixed for this point one, which involved the uh, <clears throat> clip and curve brushes. So they end up adding a point when you're doing it. So definitely if you haven't uh, got the 2020.1.1 update, um, I highly recommend grabbing it. Uh, next off, we have some other things that I want to just talk about. So if you guys are running any issues with ZBrush, uh, inside ZBrush itself, here, let me just uh, get over here. In the help menu up at the top here, there is an option to go to Pixelogic support. So you can use that to go to the support site directly. And if you go to the here, let's go back over to my browser here. This will take you to the Pixelogic support site. And one thing we've added also now that you guys can use and submit information to us um, is in the knowledge base here. If we scroll down here, there's this article, newest article called Submitting Diagnostic Reports. And if we click on this, we now have a diagnostic tool that you guys can use. So if you guys have you know, unexpected things happening inside of ZBrush, um, you can go to support site, go to the knowledge base here, and then you can download a diagnostic tool. This will send a report to us. Um, it will also send us some information on the activities that you've done in ZBrush. So every time, if you have any issues, um, this will log it. And then we can take a look at that and see, hey, this is a bug and we can go about fixing it. Um, so there is now a diagnostic tool. So if you're running into issues, you have friends that are running into issues, um, you can't figure out what is causing it. Um, we do have a diagnostic tool now that you can grab and run and that will uh, hopefully help you guys out and give us information then we can actually resolve those issues and fix it and make ZBrush run better and make everybody happy. So one little thing there. Um, also, Kyle is spamming the uh, chat here. And so we do have a ZBrush uh, content survey that we have put up and we'd love to uh, get your feedback on this, especially all you guys that are on Twitch or using all the uh, different services here to watch us stream on ZBrush Live. Um, we'd like to know what you're looking for. So things you like, things you don't like. Uh, so if you take two minutes here and fill this out, it will help us greatly. So once again, we can tailor the content to what you guys want. So in your survey, if you're like, hey, I don't want to see this dude with the beard anymore, um, <clears throat> we can definitely <laughs> remove me from the lineup if needed. Um, so yeah, so a bunch of stuff there. Uh, survey, submitting diagnostic reports. We do now have a diagnostic tool. And if you have not updated to ZBrush 2020.1.1, um, make sure you get that uh, upgraded because there are some big bug fixes in there uh, that will make ZBrush run a little bit smoother. All right, so now I'm gonna hop over to ZBrush here. 
And I gotta get through some uh, stuff today for sure because I keep going on tangents and I have not finished <laughs> this well project. This will be the, the third stream here that we have attempted to work on the well project. So I'm knocking this out today. Um, so I'm gonna look at the questions and I'm gonna take notes of some of them. So we have one to go over the UV features. Um, we also have uh, a ZBrush Tamiya one from Juan and then it looks like sliders in the morph menu. Uh, from uh, Loser Stakes Studio as well. So I'm gonna take note of those, and um, if we get to them after I finish this well, um, I'll try to get off and get on those tangents. But I wanna hit the Z-Modeler stuff today because I've been trying to get it done, and uh, I just keep going off on uh, tangents, which is good for you all, but uh, I know I've had a few people that have been like, are you gonna finish this thing yet? So I need to um, go the, through this quickly and get it done. So to start, first I'm gonna recap on some of the processes to use with the ZModeler brush. So inside of ZBrush, the ZModeler is the low poly modeling tool set. And this lives in the brush palette. And if we come down here, isolate by letter Z, you'll see there's a ZModeler brush. Now before I get into the brush and kind of using it, um, I wanna hit on some other things that I use inside of ZBrush along with this brush to create low topology or um, base meshes using, you know, poly modeling techniques. And some of these you guys may not be using, so that's why I wanna cover them, um, because there are things in here that you can do with just the other tools inside of ZBrush that will help your workflows as you're using the ZModeler brush. So I have a few examples here. So some of these I hit briefly uh, last week, but I just wanna recap, kinda of wanna get a whole kind of stream that's uh, <laughs> all related to this, rather than having broken up into like two or three streams. So the first one I hit on is uh, using the slice brushes uh, while you're generating topology models. So basically this is a primitive here, and if you go to your project menu, there's this primitive ZPR right here that you can actually load in. And this is gonna be a starter set of tools that I use when I create stuff, and so save this out and it ships with ZBrush. Um, you can load it in, it's gonna have different tool files you can actually start modeling from. So the first thing I want to talk about is the usage of the slice brushes. So if you're using the ZModeler brush and you want to add an edge, um, basically I just did a hotkey there, which is BZM, which will get you to the ZModeler brush really quick. And then by default, you'll have QMesh, which is a process that will go over a poly, which is going to add geometry to it. If you go over an edge, you'll have insert. And then if you go over point, you're going to have move. So it's context sensitive as you scroll across the model. Now, let's say I want to take this cylinder here and I want to edge loop across and edge loop in the middle. So I could come through here and do it like this with the ZModeler brush, add one here, and then add one in here. But right now, these two points, let me get a brighter material for you guys. These two lines here, they're not going to like really match up. So instead of doing it with the ZModeler brush to add a slice or a cut between your two surfaces, um, what you can do is you can use just the... Um, Slice brushes up here. So I'm holding down Control and Shift. This is gonna give me a select rectangle brush by default. And if I click this, I can now change what brush that Control Shift process is gonna use. And so I wanna select this slice curve brush here. And now what the slice curve brush is going to do is I can draw out this curve line. If you're holding down Shift, it's gonna snap at a certain angle. So if I come across and do that, you see it's gonna go like this. It has two sides to it, and this will be come into play with clip brushes, but for slice, it's just gonna cut wherever this line is. You can press spacebar to move this around after you draw it out. So if I wanna slice this cylinder, I can come through here, hold that, and it's gonna slice right through. And the one thing this slice is gonna do versus coming in and adding an insert with the Z modeler brush is that wherever this cut happens, it's gonna happen all the way through the mesh. So it's gonna get this inner line and this outer line are gonna be the exact same distance from each other. And this is handy if you wanna come through and start cutting things out on your model. So if I come over here and then say do poly group all, and now Q mesh this, I'll be able to cut through my surfaces and these lines are gonna match and you're not gonna get a crazy interior. So one thing there with the slice brushes. Uh, next we have uh, the clip brushes and this is, can be used to take parts of your model and align things. So you're using the clips to align. So with this, I have, say, this slice that I cut through diagonally like this, but I want it now to go straight. So what I can do is I can mask everything but this area in here. And to do this, I can hold down the Control key. And if you just hold down Control normally and drag it out, you're gonna get this little mask box. And whatever's inside of this, any points that are inside of this, are gonna be masked. So if I drag this out and release, 
these areas are masked. And if I switch to say the Gizmo 3D, you'll see the rest of the areas are unmasked. And there's a little option too you can use with the masking brush. So as you draw it out, if you hold down Alt, it's gonna give you the inverse. And this, instead of applying a mask to the area inside of the selection, it's going to mask everything that's outside the selection. So this is handy for getting just quick areas unmasked. So if I just wanna select this part here and mask everything else, I can hold Control, drag it out, hold Alt, to turn it into this white box, and now release. And this is gonna mask everything but this line right through here. So if I switch to that, it gives me a 3D again and move. You can see now I'm moving the center areas since they're unmasked and everything else is masked. So one little thing there that's gonna speed up a little workflow with the mask pen. So holding it just with control is gonna mask the points inside. Holding it with alt is gonna mask everything else but the points inside. So now they have this area unmasked. Let's say I wanna align this. So I can come through and now grab the clip brush. So I'll grab the clip curve brush here and I can draw this out. You see it's gonna give me the same line as slice. However, on this line, we talked about that gradient quickly a second ago. The line has two areas. It has a faded side with this little gradient and then a flat side. Anything that's on the gradient side is gonna be moved to that line. So those little diagonal there, as I clip this, it's gonna take all those lines that were unmasked and then mash them to where they need to go. So this is gonna help you align stuff. So you can use clip, move it, and it's gonna help you align those parts. And this is gonna shoot all the way through the model as well. So you can see now this edge and this edge are all nice and neat. Now if I can do this again for this bottom here, so I got this crazy topology, like say I was messing around with stuff or maybe I accidentally moved things. So I can do that control option again. So drag it out, hold down alt, so mask everything but this area here. Now use that clip curve brush again, bring it across, and boom. Now I've got that all clipped up. So there you go there. So a little thing there with clip and use it for alignment and then slice for cutting. And those are two options that with the control shift functionality that work really well with the Z model brush. Now, next one here I have is the slice rectangle. So we talked about just the slice curve. There's also a few other slice brushes. So you have the rectangle and also circle. The rectangle one is really nice for just adding little details to a model as you're working on it. And what this is going to do, it's going to just slice through the model and add edges like this, and then add a new area in between here and give it a new poly group. So if you're doing anything that's kind of hard surface, you can come through and just quickly use that to cut the topology of your model. And then you come through and you know use the Z modeler brush uh, with that polygroup all, you can actually start manipulating your geometry like so. So this is really fun to uh, play with to get different designs on your meshes and you can end up start doing all sorts of crazy stuff pretty quick by just coming through and using that slice rectangle and then growing things out, slice another one here. And so it's fun to kind of just add detail and geometry in your form really quick. So instead of going in and adding edge loops, you can come through and just slice it quick and then pull those things out and get some different designs. Now, in addition to this, let's go back to my box here. And there's some uh, other things. So one thing that we get a lot of kind of questions on is modeling single-sided. And so this is a thing that uh, I started uh, in 3D using 3D Studio Max. And a lot of my poly modeling building stuff was all edge extrusions. So taking an edge and extruding it and extruding it, extruding it, extruding it to get the form. And so we get a lot of questions on, well, how can I do that? Is there a way? So there isn't a way to extrude a single edge. If your part has thickness, so let's say this example here, and we're just going to extrude this, do all the polygons here. If your part has thickness, what you can do is you can hold control, and I'm gonna do that unmask thing, and unmask an area, and then you can use, say, the Gizmo 3D, and if you hold control while you're using this, this is gonna extrude out that unmasked part. So this is one way you can kind of build with extrusions. However, you'll see that it's gonna require your mesh to have, be solid, so it can't do a single-sided edge. So if I undo this and get back here and do that same process again, like this, and then hold control and shift, it's just gonna like duplicate that part or end up just performing a move. And so you're not gonna be able to extrude off that edge. However, there's some tricks you can do to kind of get this functionality that you're kind of looking for. 
And so the one thing you can do here is we can start adding edge loops above the loop we want to pull, okay? And so let's say I want to have this shape here and I want to taper it maybe something like this, right? So I want to edge extrude this surface across something else. Maybe I'm building some like shoulder pad kind of form and have it go like this, right? So it's coming around the shoulders, down the neck, may want to wrap it under the arms. So I want that kind of shape. So what I can do here is I can insert an edge loop, you know, near the edge of that bottom form there. And then the next thing I can do is if I hover over a point here, you can see I'm defaulted to move points. So if I press spacebar on my keyboard, this is going to act activate and pop up the uh, Zmodeler point action menu. And in here, in the move option, there is this infinite depth. And you have different axes that you can choose for this infinite depth. So right now this model is set along the x-axis. So those lines and edges there are all x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose infinite x here. And this is going to look at the model in this direction. And when I perform this move, it's only going to move in that axis. So one thing you may notice when you're using ZBrush, if you go, you know, horizontal directly on a model that's just single-sided, it's going to vanish. So one thing you can do is you can just kind of taper it like this. I have this move set to infinite x. So wherever I move this now, it's not going to break that plane of geometry and cause a mess in the middle. So you can see these are still straight. So I can come through and start moving these, any of these points here, and it's not going to mess up that kind of vertical axis I had on that model. So what I can do now is I can move these. I can add another point move these, move, add another point. And this can kind of give you what you're kind of looking for in terms of using that edge extrude process. So instead of extruding the edge, you're adding a cut before the edge, and then you're moving those where you want it to go. And the size of your brush is going to determine, you know, how that geometry is going to play out. But this I end up using quite a bit um, to come through and just start adding, you know, different surfaces to my models or maybe just generating topology around other structures. So a little thing there, and that is just using that move infinite depth and you lock it into an axis and then using insert edge loop. And that's gonna come through and add an edge, move it where you want it, add an edge, move where you want it. Now, after you have the single-sided geometry created, you can now go in and use the Z modeler brush uh, options with either Q mesh or extrude to add uh, the you know, thickness to this. So I can come across the poly, press space bar to go in the Z model poly action menu. In here, if I do Q mesh, Q mesh is gonna come through and it's going to look at the surfaces and as you pull it out, it's gonna to attempt to weld. So sometimes this may not be what you're kind of looking for. So if you start dragging it out, you may see it snaps, you see it snapping through there. And this is because ZBrush is performing that weld. So the Q mesh function will do an extrude, but it's going to be like the smart extrude, and it's going to come through and apply a weld with that extrude process. If you don't want that weld to happen, all you have to do is switch your poly action from that Q mesh to extrude. And extrude is just going to do a pure extrude on your mesh, and it's not going to apply that snapping. So if I come here and drag this out now, you're going to see it's no longer going to snap. So now I've gone through and created this shape like so and I've done it with those processes and then extrude it out to get thickness. So one little thing there that may help, especially if you're doing a lot of polymodding and you are a big fan of using that edge extrude process. So now I wanna hit on some different options here. So dynamic and Q grid. So when you're using low poly models like this or you know, real time kind of meshes, there's an option inside of ZBrush where you can apply you know, dynamic tessellation to your model. So instead of coming down here and clicking this divide button to divide your mesh up, what you can do is you can put it in a preview state. And this is done in the geometry menu, so tool geometry and then dynamic subdivision. And in here there's a dynamic button. Now when you click dynamic, this is going to mimic the effect of you clicking this divide button. And it's going to give you a preview of your model as that high resolution mesh. So think of it as like a subdivision surface, um, you know, turning on those smooth subdivisions and other applications. That is what this is doing. And this is going to allow you to preview your models in this high resolution format, and, but it's only going to retain the points of that low resolution model. So you can use, you know, Z model brush, low meshes like this, have them dynamic subdivisioned all over the place. And that file size of that mesh is going to be really, really low. So you're talking about, you know, you can do a whole model. Um, some of these in here in the project area, like, uh, let me see here. 
like this uh, heavy loader and this rifle model, they're using a ton of dynamic subdivisions using the dynamic by default and then also the Q-Grid dynamic. And these files are very, very small. So if you open them up, they look like they're crazy um, high polygon count because they have you know, that dynamic option turned on. But if you save the CPR out, it's like less than a meg. So using dynamic is also gonna help you, you know, keep your file sizes low so you're not ending up with millions and millions of polygons all over the place and gigs and gigs of uh, files. So I use dynamic quite a bit and then I'll retain it in this dynamic form and then at the very last, if I need a 3D printed or something like that, then I'll convert the dynamic to traditional subdivisions uh, to get that mesh out. So little thing there with dynamic. Now with dynamic, you have two forms that we've been talking about. So I have just the normal dynamic, which is gonna mimic this divide. And this process is good for models that have roundness. So anything that is round, you wanna use normal dynamic. And so as an example here, we have this cylinder, right? So this is normal dynamic. Now, in addition to normal dynamic, you have this Q-Grid option. And Q-Grid is going to give you this effect that's going to take the edges of your mesh and it's gonna apply edge bumping to them. So in traditional kind of poly modeling scenarios, if I wanted to, let me just kill my creases here. If I wanted to keep an edge harsh, like if I come over here and turn on dynamic, you can see the preview here. This is what I get if I have no creasing, right? And so in traditional you know, modeling packages, if I want that edge to be harsh, what I would end up doing is that I come through here and I'd add some edge loops close to each other. And this is called like edge bumping. So the closer these edges to another edge, when you actually process that, is gonna determine how soft or how hard that edge is gonna be tessellated, right? So the Q-Grid option, what that's gonna do, it's gonna look at all your edges and apply a similar process to it. So any edge you have, it's gonna go through and apply these edges next to it to kind of tailor how sharp or how hard that crease happens. So if I undo this back here and now apply my crease is back. And now apply Q-Grid, you're gonna see that ZBrush is going to take all those edges and now apply this edge bumping to it. Now you're not gonna be able to see this process unless you convert the model over here by clicking apply. So if you just have it activated, this is what you're gonna see. And if you click apply, then you can see all of these edges that are being generated. So the apply option is gonna take any of your dynamics and convert it to geometry. So you can see QGrid is coming across all those edges that I had and supplying edges near those edges to allow them to be harsh. Now, one thing with QGrid is it works awesome for anything that's blocky, chunky, hard-edged type stuff. It does not work well for cylinders, okay? So with this model here, you can see that since it's hitting all the edges, it's hitting all the edges around the edge, the <laughs> cylinder. And this is now breaking the illusion of this being smooth. Now you can change the coverage on this and kind of see how this is gonna change or modify the Q-Grid option here. But you're gonna notice that if you have a cylinder and you have dynamic and then Q-Grid enabled, that cylinder is never going to be smooth. So you wanna make sure that if you have any cylindrical objects, round things, that you're using dynamic without Q-Grid. But then if you have anything that's like boxes, um, blockier type forms, you can use Q-Grid and get a nice bevel on your model and it's gonna make everything look a lot better. So two things there with Q-Grid and Dynamic. So here we have an example of, again, with a cube. So here's Dynamic. This is just Dynamic on this cube. And then if I turn on Q-Grid, you can now see that it's now gonna apply those edge bumpings, and I can adjust my Q-Grid settings here to tailor how soft or how hard this edge is gonna be. And this is gonna give me a nice result on this kind of flat surface model. Now, with the uh, Q-Grid stuff, too, um, you can do a lot of different things with it, and it ends up creating interesting designs. So with this cube here, what I can do is I can come through, and I'm just going to make a little shape to kind of show you guys what you can do with Q-Grid on a mesh. So I'm going to come across the poly here. This is just a simple six-sided cube here. And I'm going to hover over one of these polys here. I'm going to press spacebar. I'm gonna choose the inset option. And here I'm gonna do all polygons and I'm gonna keep a border only on this one here. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna look at all the polys on my model. It's gonna inset them, but it's only gonna retain the border edges. So if I come across any of these models here, I can start insetting this and this is what I'm gonna generate, right? So I'm basically taking this cube and popping out all the middle parts and then adding 
this kind of form to it. And if I turn on double here, you can see this is what I have. Now right now this mesh is still single-sided, so if I turn on double, I can kind of see the back there. But I want to give it a little bit of thickness, so I'm going to hover over one of the polys again, go into the poly action menu here. I'm going to use the Q mesh option again, keep it on all polygons. And now I'm going to Q mesh that out to give this a little bit of thickness. So now I've just taken that cube and now I've made <laughs> this cube with this inner kind of area here. Now with this, I'm now going to go back to my dynamic subdivision area. And I'm going to activate dynamic. And you can see this is what I get with just dynamic on, no Q grid. Now I can change my smoothing here, and if this is the form I was looking for, I can get that. But let's say I want to start playing with that Q grid option. And so I'm going to come over here and adjust my Q grid, set this to say two or three. And now I'm getting this shape. Now if I adjust my coverage, I can start to tailor this even more. So now you can see I'm getting the rounder edge on my shape here. I can also change to a more of a bevel instead of a chamfer. I can adjust the constant value here. And so you can see just by changing these Q grid options, I'm now getting this different feel for the surface of my model. And you can come through and start playing with this sliders over here. And this is gonna allow you to get different effects. So this is all the same cube. And all I'm doing is manipulating sliders. And now I'm getting a different result. So there's a bunch of sliders over here. The coverage is gonna determine how those edge borders are coming across the surface of your mesh. So if it's gonna be close or far. And then you can determine if they're gonna be constant or unconstant. You can also chamfer them. You can apply the bevel. The Q grid here is gonna tell you how many of those edge bumps are gonna happen. You can also add some flat subdivision surfaces to there, which is gonna allow that process to be harsher. So if you turn this up or down, you're gonna get different values in there. And then you can still control your dynamic subdivision as well. So this one's a lot of fun to play with if you just need some simple designs or shapes on your model, but you're not quite sure what really you want. You can come through and play with that. It also makes uh, some really cool quick earrings. So if I have this here, I can come through and just take these and maybe duplicate this. Got too much, too much cute. Let's turn it down a little bit. And so now you can start, you know, making some sort of earring shape design here. Oh, we went crazy on that one. But there we go. And now you've got some sort of lattice structure, right? So quick and easy stuff, just using the Q grid. Now, one more thing I want to hit on the dynamic stuff as well is let me turn off Q grid here. Here we have my cylinder. Now with the dynamic, dynamic is going to respect creasing. And so inside of ZBrush, you can apply creasing to the edges of your model. This can be done with the Z modeler brush. There's a crease option here. So you can crease and you can do this by edge loop complete, edge, all sorts of different uh, kind of targets. You can also come over here to the geometry palette and go to the crease area. In here, we have a tolerance slider and then we have a crease and crease all, uncrease, we increase by poly groups. We can uncrease by poly groups. So I usually end up coming through, and if I have an object like that cylinder there, and I want these edges to be harsh, I'll come over here, set this to 45, and click crease. It's gonna crease all those edges that fall in that tolerance. And then when I activate dynamic, I'm gonna get a smooth shape. Now, in addition to dynamic using and looking at these creases, what you can do is you can control the crease level. And so that's what this crease level slider here is doing. Now the crease level slider is usually used with just division. So basically what the crease level is gonna tell you ZBrush to do is, hey, at this level, you know, hold that crease, but then when that subdivision gets past that level, don't hold that crease anymore. So right now it's set to 15. So if I keep dividing this model and say, you know, using this smooth subdivision slider here or just clicking divide, it's gonna keep dividing the mesh and it's gonna hold that crease until that subdivision level gets past 15, which isn't ever gonna happen. But let's say I change this now to say two. So at two, what ZBrush is doing, it's looking at the model and it's going to hold the crease up to that subdivision of level two or your smooth subdivision level of two. And then it's gonna relax that crease and then just apply a normal subdivision. So I may be <laughs> explaining this uh, a little bit crazy here. So basically, you can change when this crease holding starts or stops. And this is gonna allow you to tailor the edges of your mesh. So right now I have smooth subdivision levels of four, or I could have it divided up to four, and I have my crease level at three. So subdivision level one, 
holding the crease. Subdivision level two, holding the crease. Subdivision level three, holding the crease. Subdivision level four, we're not holding the crease anymore. And so then it's just applying that normal subdivision. So you can change this and you'll see as I do this, the mesh's edges are changing. So you can see now this is softer through here just by changing this crease level. And if I crank it up more, I now have this harsher edge. And if I lower it down, it's gonna be a softer edge. And then depending on where my smooth subdivision slider is in addition to this crease, you can now make these little beveled shapes just using dynamic. And your edge topology is also gonna come and play on this because when that crease lets go, it's no longer holding that edge and then it's gonna to fall to that edge bumping, right? So with this, you can see I have no edges through here. So as soon as this crease lets go, it's gonna start using this as manual. So if I turn this down to zero, this is what it's gonna to go to. And so then you can see at subdivision level one, I'm applying the crease at one, but then at subdivision level two, it's not applying it. At two, it's doing it there. And you can see this edge is getting harsher as I increase this crease level here. So one little thing there with crease levels and using dynamic subdivision. So if you want some beveled edges, tapered edges, mess with this crease level slider. It'll give you some cool stuff. All right, so let's see. I got one more here and then we're gonna go to the well. Let's look at these questions here. So I uh, started this off. I've gotta <laughs> work on this uh, well here with the Z model brush. So I'm gonna try not to go into crazy tangents. I've taken some notes on some of the questions you guys have, but I need to get this well done. And then if there's time afterwards, I'm gonna go back and hit all these. So uh, Dan Pants, this one I can answer. Uh, the UV peel is still in development. Um, it's pretty much where it is right now. So we're still working on it. Uh, got some things on detail. Workflow using poly paint with layers. So men drag grown, that's, uh, it's kind of the way I say I do it. So the question was asked, is there any workflows using poly paint with layers, uh, duplicating the subtool, collapsing the layers, then paint and extract the UV map and add it to the original subtool. Uh, there's a few tricks you can do with projection as well. Um, I'll make a note of it and we can cover that um, if I get through this uh, well. So do poly paint with layers. And I think that's where we're at. All right, so I got one more little trick here for uh, the Z modeler processes that I use quite a bit. And then we're gonna go and hit the well. So with Z modeler, uh, let's say you wanna make a bent pipe or uh, maybe just a, an interesting shape with your mesh. And so one thing you can do if you've ever tried this kind of manually is let's say I want to bend this, right? So I could go and use a deformer. I could start adding edge loops. I, there's a bunch of ways I can kind of do it. But one way that I like doing with the Z modeler brush is using the bridge to hole functionality. So what I'm going to do with this uh, capsule here is I'm going to hold control and shift. And I'm just going to isolate this front part of the capsule here. And with this isolated, I'm just gonna apply a new poly group to it. And you can do this quickly by just hitting Control W on your keyboard. And this is gonna apply the, I think it's the, in the masking area here. It's going to apply the, maybe it isn't, where's it at? Where's it at, the poly groups. It's gonna apply this group mask, clear mask format right here. So that's what Control W is doing. And this is going to look at what you have. If it has masking, it's going to apply a poly group to that mask. If there's no masking, it's just going to apply the poly group to everything. So I use that quite a bit to kind of clear poly groups out of my model. So if I bring everything back and say, hey, I don't want, you know, all these poly groups all over the place, Control W, we'll just put it all back to one. So Control W is really handy um, in going through and adding quick poly groups to your meshes. So basically, I just made a poly group there and a poly group there. So just have two of these parts. Now with these two parts, basically I want to take this end and I want to move it off into space, but I want to detach it from this other part here. So I could do a group split. So I come to the geometry palette, I go to split, do group split. However, this is going to give me two subtools. I don't want two subtools. I just want one subtool. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to the geometry palette. I'm going to come down here to the modified topology area. And in here we have a unweld groups border. So this is handy too if you're sending meshes to Keyshot and you want to apply you know, different materials to polygrouping. Um, using this unweld groups border, we'll just come through and split it. If also you want to say make uh, pixel art inside of ZBrush, uh, this is also a great way. You can apply, take a plane, 
apply polygrouping to the plane to get your pixel art, and then just do this unweld groups border, and it's going to split those off, and then that's going to allow you to apply different materials to each poly. Um, so materials, in general, if you apply it, it's going to kind of apply like polygrouping, but if you have attached points, the material is going to attempt to blend. It's kind of like uh, vertex coloring, basically. And so you can split it using this unweld uh, groups border here, and this is going to split the mesh by that group. And so now both of these are separate. So now if I come through and select this one, I'm just going to apply a mask to that. And then now I can use the Gizmo 3D and move it. You can see it's no longer welded. So that's a little handy thing there, especially if polygroups, you can split them. If you want to weld them back, you can just come over here and click this weld points and it'll weld all those you know, edges. If you keep your distance slider pretty low, it's just going to weld the points you have. Uh, also, if you do another Q mesh action on that mesh, it's going to apply a weld too. So if you split it and then use QMesh and you're like, why is the split not there anymore? It's because there was that weld that took place. So it's handy and you can get it back uh, welded again if you need to. So I'm gonna take this and rotate it 90 here. Uh, one little another thing with the Gizmo 3D, if you wanna set a angle for snapping on this, if you come up here to the Z plugin tab, go to miscellaneous, there's a snap angle slider here. You can set this to a value, so if you want to snap to 45 degrees only instead of that 5 degrees, you can set that to 45 and then click snap, set snap angle. And then now when you use the Gizmo 3, it's going to snap to 45 degrees. Um, so a little thing there with Gizmo 3D and snapping. So I'm going to move this up to here. And I do this quite a bit on, I don't know, just kind of like any sort of shape. Because basically it gives really nice. So if you have like, we were making that kind of thing that was like a shoulder pad. So basically I could take that front part through here and I could stop it right at the shoulders. And then as it stops at the shoulders, I could just cut those polygons off. And then I could bridge this hole and this hole and expand it backwards. And it's going to make this nice curve around the back of those two shapes. So that's kind of what I end up using it for um, to kind of connect two shapes but gives curves to it. Um, so I can do like this, and then say come in, hover over one of these edges. Um, if it's hard to select an edge, you have an option with the Z-Modeler Brush 2. You can come through and you can disable the other functions. So let's say I have, you know, maybe I'm zoomed out, and as I hover over, you can see I'm getting on that Q-Mesh action right on the edge, but I really just want to perform that edge action. So if you hover over the poly and press spacebar, in here there is a do nothing, uh, where is it at? Do nothing option here. And this is now going to temporarily disable that polygon action. So now if you hover over that polygon, you can see it's going to give me that crease edge action instead of that polygon. So it's disabling that process. So if you find that, hey, I, I just want to move a bunch of points, but every time I try to move a point, I'm doing a Q mesh on a poly or I'm doing an insert edge loop, you can disable, you can set the uh, edge loop to do nothing and you can set the poly to do nothing and then only have the point being active. So there's a bunch of ways you can tailor the Z-Modeler brush that way. And you can also save out custom Z-Modeler brushes. So if you have a modeler brush that's set up like that, that say only Q-Mesh, ignores edges, ignores points, you can save that out. And then when you select that brush, those settings will be remembered. And so you can just hit use your hotkeys to select that brush quick and then use it. And it's only going to give you, say, that Q-Mesh action and ignore the edge and ignore the point. So all sorts of things you can do customize-wise uh, with the Z-Modeler brush. So what I want to do is I want to hover over an edge here and press spacebar. In here I'm going to find the bridge option and I'm going to do two holes. Now with two holes you have a bunch of different ways you can you know, close these holes. So you have spline, circle, arcs, and some of these you kind of just need to mess with. So if you use one of them and it drags it out and you don't like that curve, go in and try another one and uh, you usually end up getting the uh, kind of result you're looking for. You have an option for curvature, um, resolution. I usually end up keeping it mostly on the interactive option so I kind of see how it's going to go. Uh, you also have the option for polygroups, so you can set it as rows, you can set it as flat, you can set it as columns. Um, I usually end up just bridging and then I'll come through and clear my polygroups. I do a lot of that. Um, Paul, on the other hand, will go through and keep kind of all his polygroups as he's working, like he wants to retain them. I usually just use them to model something really quick and then I'll just clear everything out and then keep going, and then at the end, if I need to split things apart, that's when I'll go back in and re-polygroup uh, stuff, and then use that on weld groups border and some other things. So I selected that first edge, selected the second edge down here, and these can be any of the edges on that edge there. It doesn't really matter. If it's hard you know, to kind of navigate, just rotate. And you see now it's gonna apply this kind of form here. 
And so this will allow you to get bevels and angles on it. So this little like two arcs one may not be, you know, the best one there. So I can come through and say, maybe go circle. And you can try these and this is gonna come through and bridge those objects. Now, after you have these kind of set, the vertical orientation is gonna end up, you know, giving you different divisions. And then the horizontal movement is gonna end up giving you, you know, the elevation on that surface. So you can come through and start adding, you know, processes or curves and bridge surfaces. Now, as an example with that kind of shoulder pad kind of thing, so I'm gonna come up through and just delete this part there, and I'm just gonna duplicate this. So I'm gonna hold control and just get two of these here. And then you can use these not only with like cylinder objects, you can pretty much bridge anything. So I'm gonna cap these edges quick, so I'm gonna hover over an edge here. I'm gonna go into the close. I'm gonna do convex hole. Let me get out my masking here and close this convex hole. The convex hole also will give you this kind of functionality too, which is similar in just what we had. And then repeat that over there and then clear my polygroups. And so let's say I want to, let's insert, where you add edge? Edge and edge there and an edge there. And then we're gonna go through and we're gonna do that kind of bridging again. Uh, I'm gonna come through and delete say two of these like that. And I'm gonna come across that edge again. And it can be any of the edges. We're gonna use the bridge two holes. And select this one and then select this one. And so now I can see I'm getting this, right? So you end up starting using this to kind of generate, you know, all sorts of different things. And then we can use all our slice stuff. So let's say I wanna slice through there. And then maybe I wanna come through and grab this and then maybe Q mesh this up single poly and so you can start getting like really crazy forms pretty quick and then after you have these done you can now go back up and say use your dynamic option oh mesh integrity let's fix that if you ever get that mesh integrity error uh, you can come down here to the tool geometry mesh integrity and there's a check mesh and a fix mesh and that will come through and fix it um, you may sometimes when you're using the zmodel brush um, if you do a bridge two faces and you have symmetry on, occasionally that symmetry, if you have it in multiple accesses, so if you come to the transform palette, there is symmetry here, but you can also access it in multiple access. So you can do X and Y symmetry or X and Z symmetry or X, Y and Z symmetry. And if you're using the bridge edges or the bridge two holes, if you have that symmetry and it's crossing over, it's gonna give you multiple polygons on top of each other. And so when that happens, if you try to turn on that dynamic, it may give you a, hey, there's polygons on top of each other. You can just come to Mesh Integrity, click that Fixed Mesh, and it's gonna clear that up. And so now we can do that, and then we can apply some creasing. And so now we can start, you know, making these different shapes with the z Mallet brush. All right. <laughs> so now, let's get back to our well. So this is what we're going to model out here. And this is all using just the Z-Modeler brush. Um, if I'm not talking through this, it's, it's pretty fast. Um, basically, we're breaking down very simplistic forms on our mesh here. So we have cylinders, we have cubes, and that's pretty much it. Like those are your main forms that are coming in here and you know processing the mesh. Yes, so the, the do nothing, you have to do it on each one. So there's not a do nothing other option. So it's basically each of those menus is gonna control what process. So if you're in edge, all those actions are only gonna be edge and the other ones are only gonna be poly and the only ones are gonna be points and they also have a curves one too. Um, so you'd have to go into, basically there, there's no cross uh, pollination of those. So there's no edge actions in the poly action menu. So you will have to go into each different one and then disable. Now you could also just start with a Z model brush that has do nothing set on everything. And then you can go in and set what you want on and off too. So there's ways you can get a little bit speed increases. And if you find that you're always disabling it, um, you can save those out and make them as custom Z model brushes. All right, so I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna start with this uh, base here. And then we'll go up and add these kind of posts. Uh, we'll do this little roof panel. And these are all very, very just primitives. And a lot of these shapes here, if I just come through, you can see they're all using kind of dynamic attributes. So if I come through and just disable all these here, 
and I'm pressing the down arrow key on my keyboard to go to the next subtool. So if you have a lot of processes, um, there are some plugins that you can download on the resources center, which will go through and repeat everything across subtools. But if you, <laughs> if you don't want to go do that and you just want to lazily go through all your subtools and activate or deactivate a process, up and down arrow keys are going to allow you to go quickly through those subtools. So to quickly, you know, come through and say, hey, let's turn dynamic on everything. Just click, 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 click. And there you go, they're all on. And then if you want to turn them off, And it also makes fun music while you're doing it. So <laughs> there you go. All right, so this is what it looks like without any of the dynamic subdivisions. I think I have them all turned off. So you can see I have some tessellation through here. Uh, if I turn on my polyframes and kind of isolate these, you can see the roof's pretty simple. These guys are also pretty simple. So you don't have to be really complex um, with a lot of your forms. Uh, you can basically just think of it as primitives and model them quick with the Z modeler brush get the result you want, and then you can use the dynamic to give you those beveled edges, those nice soft forms. Then you can make basically two of these things and uh, use one as your high res, use one as your low res, and then unwrap your low res, do your bakes, yada, 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 you're done. So easy stuff uh, through here. So I'm gonna start modeling this part here. And last time I started with the cylinder pipe, uh, today I'm gonna use this uh, cylinder inner loop one. So the Tools I have over here loaded are all using this project primitive ZPR. So if you want to replicate this process, just come into ZBrush. When Lightbox opens up, go to the project area, locate the primitives.zpr file, double click that, it's going to load it in, and then we're going to start the well. So I'm just going to keep my, my reference over here. If you're working inside of ZBrush and you kind of want to you know, store stuff really quick, you can snapshot things to the canvas. This is going to take the model and lock it down to 2.5D. So this is handy for just say, hey, I want to replicate this mesh I did earlier. May I want to remake this mesh? May I just want to see what the model looks like from this side as I'm working on something else? So you can just position it anywhere in your canvas. Uh, after it's positioned, you can hit uh, Shift S and that's going to snapshot it. So now we have a 3D one, and then that other one is in 2.5D, and you can store you know, multiple angles like this. So I'm just gonna put my original one over there so I have a point of reference there. It's blocked by my head. Blocked by my head. Oh yeah, so Kyle also wants me to put these up too. So we have some other things, uh, this little thing that just popped up on the bottom. So Saul will be going on March 5th, and then also we have a presentation of the Lion King that we had at the last year's ZBrush Summit. Uh, it's now available, so you can actually, it got cleared through all the you know, approval processes from MPC and Disney and everything else, and so you can now watch that presentation online. So if you were not at the summit um, and you didn't know, weren't able to see it, um, you can now watch that, and the link is right there. So I'll leave that up for a minute here as I start messing with this well here. So I'm gonna set the uh, cylinder inner loops tool here, and this is what this uh, tool looks like. And the inner loops is just telling me, hey, I've got this section of inner geometry on my mesh here. And this is handy just because if I wanna punch a hole through it, I can easily do it. Um, you can always just come through and make it too, but this just, it's like saves like a few seconds, uh, especially if you know if you're gonna take something and make a hole out of it. So I want to first rotate this, so my well is kind of vertical like this. So I'm going to take this model, turn on perspective here, get my gizmo 3D. I'm going to rotate, hold down shift, and then snap that to 90. So I've got my well there. Now after I have this, you can see I have this top part and this bottom part. And this bottom part is also tapered outward. So last stream I did a little different things with um, insert meshing and using the intensity to kind of add the uh, tapering to it. This time I'm just gonna kind of speed through this because I kind of did a different version of at least this well part already. <laughs> and I want to get this thing done um, in the stream here. So I'm just gonna mask out the bottom. So holding control, holding down alt to make sure it's the only thing selected and then releasing. And then now I can just go to the gizmo 3D and then click this little go to unmask mesh center. It's gonna put it on the bottom and then I can taper that out. So that's one way you can get that quick taper on the mesh. Now before I do that taper, what I want to do is I want to establish this edge through here for this top part because I want it to come through here and I want this part to be tapered only. So I want it to go tapered and then straight up, right? So I want this and then out. So I don't want this kind of curved all the way through and then have this being like this weird tapered thing. So I'm gonna switch to the slice 
curve brush here and just cut through this really quick. So this is what we showed earlier. Now I have that cut. Now I'm gonna do that masking process on the bottom, select that, gives my 3D, center unmasked points, scale it out, move that up a little bit, scale it a little down. So now I got that. Now I want to extrude this bottom out. I'm gonna come across a poly, and make sure I'm in that Q mesh action. For my target this time, what I wanna choose, I wanna choose flat island. So flat island is going to look at the poly that you currently are hovering over, and when you apply this, it's gonna look at the surface normals. And if those surface normals are all flat, it's gonna apply the process to that flat area. So I'm gonna click flat island, and drag this out here, and this is now gonna give me that little bottom base there. I can adjust any of these by doing that control, holding down alt to make it a selection, go to unmask mesh center, move that up. Now this one I want to extrude out to give this portion here. So draw mode, hover over this poly. Now this area, you can see it is the same poly group as this bottom one here. So I wanna apply a new poly group just around this ring through here. So I'm gonna hover over an edge, press spacebar. I'm now gonna choose poly group. Make sure my target is poly loop. Click that. As I click this and hold, if you press alt, this will allow you to change the poly group coloring. So this will allow it, you know, just be a little more visible through there. So now this should be all one single poly group. Now I can go to the Q mesh, spacebar to go back in here. I can now do this by polygroup all. So since that is the only area with that polygroup, I can now polygroup all that. And now when I apply that Q mesh action, it's just going to apply that polygroup to there. So you can see now I have that base there. Now I have this little taper from here to here, so it's not this straight area. So I'm gonna use that masking option again, hold down Alt to invert it, switch to the Gizmo 3D, go to Unmask Mesh Center, scale that out. I can adjust anything now as well if I want. So just using you know, the masking and unmasking processes. So if I want this to be a little bit wider, select that, go to Unmask Mesh Center, wind that out, move it down a little bit. Same thing, move that down a little bit. So now I've got that base going there. Now I wanna add the lip to this. So I'm gonna come across this poly group here. And I'm not sure if this poly group is somewhere else in my model. So I can quickly come through and clear all my poly groups and give it everything one poly group. And then come across this and poly group poly loop again, hold down alt to change that. And then now I can Q mesh that out. And now I have that part there. To make this a little bit wider. There we go like that. And now I wanna generate my inner circle through here. So I'm gonna come across an edge through here, press spacebar, go to the edge action menu, choose insert this time, and do it as a single edge loop. Uh, one thing with the single edge loop option, you also have multiple edge loops, and the multiple edge loops, you may not always wanna add multiple edge loops to your mesh, but they will allow you to add a edge loop in the center between two edges. So let's say, an example of this, we're doing Z-modeler tangent here, Let's say I wanna add an edge directly in the center of this edge and this edge. So I could try to eyeball this by coming with the insert edge loop and try to you know, figure out where that center point is, but you're never really gonna get it center. So if I want it exactly in the center, I can hover over that edge, go into that edge action menu again, choose multiple edge loops this time. And now if I click, and if you go all the way until it stops, you'll see that it's gonna add that edge loop right in the center. If you keep changing this, then you're gonna get those multiple edge loops, right? So if you keep dragging horizontally, you're gonna get multiple edge loops. But your initial click is always gonna put that last one in the center. So you can use multiple edge loops to get a center edge loop between two edges. So little, little thing there. So now I have this in the center of this edge and this edge exactly in the middle there. Now you'll see since I had creasing on this edge here, so this was just left from that cylinder object when I initially had it created, you'll see that the creasing has also been replicated on this inner loop here. So sometimes when you're doing things like this, adding multiple edge loops, um, you may not want that creasing to go with it. So at that point, you may just want to come through and remove this. Uh, so I don't really want any of this creasing now. I'm gonna go back in and recrease everything. So I'm gonna go to the tool palette. I'm gonna go to the geometry area here. I'm gonna go to edge loop or go to crease. I'm just gonna do an uncrease all, and that's gonna remove all that creasing there. And now for my center of my well here, I wanna select this and this, and then push it down into the model. So creating that inner portion of that well. 
Now the fun way to do it is if you come through and you hold down Alt, and this is gonna give you a temporary poly group. And as you hover over that poly, holding down Alt and clicking and dragging, you can go wee and make this white poly group. That's the fun way. Um, and then you can come through and just kind of come through and select both of those. Now the white poly group when using the Z modeler brush is going to be temporary. And so what this means, wherever you apply an action, it's gonna to apply to the white poly group and where you click. So if I come over here and did Q mesh poly group all, it's gonna poly get all this poly group over here and the white area. So the white temporary poly group is gonna be an addition to where we are. But if you just do it on the white poly group, it's just gonna apply there. So this is kind of handy if you wanna say, hey, I wanna do something over here and over here, you can put a white poly group here, a white poly group here, and then when you apply it, it's gonna to apply to both those areas. So I just want to push this in, so I'm just going to hover over this, I'm going to do single poly this time, and single poly is going to affect that one polygon that I'm on, but since it has that white poly group, everything with that white poly group is going to be affected as well. So as I Q-mesh this in, you can see I can start going into the surface of the model here. Now you'll notice the Q-mesh is going to snap, so we talked about this earlier, so as you can see as I go down, it's going to try to perform that weld function. So I don't want that to happen, so I'm just going to have it live right there, I don't want to punch a hole uh, through my weld. Now, if you find when you get to this stage that, hey, this, uh, this dimension through here, I kind of want it a little, I want this to be a little thinner, right? So what you can do is I can come through and just polygroup everything here, come across this, I'm gonna add a polygroup quickly through there. And now that this has a new polygroup to it, what I can do is I can come across this and change this to polygroup all. And now I can perform a Q mesh action or an extrude. And as I perform this action, I can hold down the shift key. And the shift key is gonna allow me to move that poly. So there's two bonus things with Q mesh and extrude. One is shift is gonna perform a move. And the other fun one, which we'll use for say this kind of post through here, is if you hold down the control key. So if I Q mesh and then hold down control, this is gonna perform an extract. Um, so two little things there with Q mesh, you can come through and apply. So I'm gonna just move this out like so and make that a little bit wider through there. So there I have my well. Now I'm gonna remove this uh, loop as well so I don't really need it. So I'm gonna go and insert single poly, remove that. And I think that's everything I want through here. We'll move that as well. So there I have my base there. So now I'm gonna apply my creasing. So I'm gonna come through here and I'm going to crease by 45 degrees. Let's apply the creasing on top of the mesh. If I want to move this down, I can move it too. So I may come through and do a extrude. And we'll do it by flat island. Make it a little bit deeper. Push it down. There we go. And now I can turn on my dynamic subdivision. And you can see this is what I'm getting with that creasing by default. So it's 100% creasing there. Let's say I want this edge to be a little beveled. Well, I could use the uh, crease level over here. This is one way I can kind of control this. So I can turn this down and you see now it's gonna get those edges a little bit softer. So this is one method here. And then I can subdivide that up and play with my creasing. So now I have a little soft bevel there. So one way there, changing the crease level. The other way I can do this is I can come through and actually start beveling the edges based on that edge loop. And this is just gonna give me more edges on that area, and then I can now apply tapering to it. So I can come across this edge here, hold spacebar, go to bevel. I'm gonna do edge loop complete. And I come across this edge here, and as I drag this out, you'll see it's gonna bevel this edge. So this is handy if you just wanna do some quick beveling to your surfaces. And anything with the Q mesh action, if you do it once and you click anywhere again, it's gonna kinda of repeat that. So you can see this, edge here is the same as that. And then if I come over here and click, it's gonna repeat it again. And then I can come through and say repeat it on that one. And so now I have those beveled. Now I kinda of want these edges harsh on the tops and then flat down the sides there. So I'm gonna apply that creasing again. So I'm gonna to to crease, edge loop complete, crease, 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 crease. And now when I apply my dynamic subdivision levels, Oh, missed, missed two creases. Let's go in there and crease them. There we go. We got my base of my welder. All right. So let's see. I'm going to check questions here quick. Yeah, I'll do the rope again on this stream. All 
So we have a question about turning the pole on the top of a cylinder to a quad mesh. Um, there isn't really, a, say, like an easy way um, to kind of do it. Uh, the best way you can kind of do, let's see, if you go to this here. So we have a surface. So you have kind of two options um, here to kind of do it. So what I usually end up doing is you can do bridging. Um, which takes a while because you have to come across and bridge the edges. Um, if you just need a quick kind of non-pole cap, what you can do is you can delete this. Um, let's delete that. And then you can just do a close holes function, um, which will close it. These aren't going to be quads, which is really what you're asking for. Um, but that will get rid of that pole if you just need a flat surface there. Um, the only other real way is to use bridging. Um, there are some kind of trickery uh, you can kind of do with the bridging to kind of make it go faster um, but basically it's just coming in and doing edges and you click one click two click one click two and that would be your process there so there's no like way to just quickly quad that out um, you'd have to end up using bridging like a manual type process like this now you could do an extrusion where you can take the mesh and split it into a half and then do some other craziness but there's no uh, simple way to, uh, you can get triangles with the closed holes or you can get the kind of the pole with the outer rings. Um, there's the closed holes is what, so the question's asking, is there a non-pole um, one? So if you do close, you have convex hole and uh, concave hole. Convex hole is the one that's gonna give you the pole. This other one here, let me hide Solomon's face. He's the other one is gonna perform that close holes function. So that's the one that's gonna give you the triangles there. And so that's just gonna apply across that surface. So it's still gonna give you like a pole somewhere in your mesh. Um, so it's not gonna be perfect. But you can do that. There you go. But you can have to manually come through and go through it. Um, for deselecting a temporary polygroup, you can, but it's kind of crazy. Um, so let's say I have this as my temporary polygroup here. So let me see if I remember how to do this. <laughs> you have to, yeah, so if you hold Alt and click, it's gonna apply a temporary polygroup. Uh, to deselect it, you just need to hold Alt and click again and it's gonna delete select it. However, you'll see that it's gonna change the polygroup when that happens. So you'd have to actually perform a copy polygroup. And man, I never, I think Paul uses this more than me. I never copy the polygroup. Um, you have to hit Paul up on his stream and say, Paul, show me how to copy polygroups. Um, he'll go through and do it. <laughs> it's like Alt and Shift. Yeah, it's like Alt and Shift. I, I can't remember. Sorry, I can't remember the, the hotkey format for it. Sorry. Sorry. Ask Paul. He'll, he'll hit you up on how to do it. I usually just clear him. I hit Control W and just clear it and then just continue modeling. All right, so now I got the base done. We can now do these sides quick. So for these, I'm just gonna append in a cube. So I have a Q cube model here. And for this, I wanna make sure that my little gizmo here is going uh, facing forward here as I create these. So I'm gonna put this off to the side there. For this, this is just a quick cube here. And this is part of that primitive. I'm just using the Gizmo 3D to manipulate this around. Right, move this up. Now, one thing that you can do too, so like you'll see, I wanna make sure this is kind of flush with the bottom. I don't want it really hanging off. I don't really want it up here. I want it like on the ground. So with this, I'm gonna use the macro that's gonna allow me to snap my models to the true 00, zero world of ZBrush. So I'm gonna come and first select my base of my well here. I'm gonna go to the macro tab here. I'm gonna go to macros. In here, there's a snap to ground, and this is gonna take your mesh, it's gonna look at it in that y-axis, and then it's gonna snap it to the ground. So if you turn on your floor here, you can see you have, let's see if I can get this to show. Inside ZBrush, you have a floor that's gonna go to the lowest subtool, but then you also have another position in there that's the true center of the world. And the floor is controlled by this document, where is it? Uh, draw 
elevation slider right here. So in draw, there's an elevation slider. If this is a negative one, it's floor is gonna always gonna go to the bottom of your largest subtool. So if that subtool is all the way down the bottom, when you have this a negative one, it's always gonna go to the bottom. If you set this to zero, it's gonna go to the true zero, zero of the world. So you can see this is where the true zero, zero of the world is, right? So it's in the middle of my uh, base for my well here. But then if I had this elevation set to negative one, you can see now it's showing up at the bottom of that post down there, because that's the lowest subdivision, lowest uh, subtool that's in my scene. So if you want your models to go to the true zero, zero world, you can snap them quickly by coming to this macro tab and then you snap to ground and that's gonna snap them to them. So you can see that's the true zero, zero, and then we can snap that one to ground. And so now the bottom of this tool and the bottom of this tool are nice and aligned. So one thing there you can do to kind of align those up. And uh, yes, so uh, Dode Roku is saying you can also say for the uh, capping of the cylinder, you can use the um, gizmo and inside a plane and then you can bridge the two holes and it will do it that way. You can also, now that I think about it, um, you can also use mesh fusion. Um, so if you come through, you can replace that entire polygon with a uh, piece of geometry there. But actually that the bridge with the um, plain 3D object is probably gonna be your best bet. And then you can use the clip brush to kind of flatten that surface at the top. So you can just have a bunch of uh, plain 3D objects that have correct amount of subdivisions you want and then do that. Thank you, Dode Roku. I'm probably massacring that name. <laughs> All right, so I got my post here. So we're gonna make this taller. So move this up and use this macro again. Get to the center of that ground, boom, look at that. Um, you can also just mask the bottom out if you're concerned about doing it, you know, like that. So I got my post somewhere up there. I want this kind of to taper through here. So I'm gonna use that control masking with alt, select that center, go to unmask mesh center, move that in a little bit. I also wanna kind of be a little wonky. So I'm gonna move that in just tad like so. Now for this post, I want it to use QGrid. So you can see it's really harsh right now. So I'm gonna come down to my dynamic option, enable it. And then in here, I'm gonna set my Q grid value and adjust my coverage to kind of get this to taper. You can apply some flat subdivisions as well. I can change this to a bevel or chamfer, keep it constant. You can play with these sliders and this is just gonna soften up that edge there. So now I've just added that post. Now I want this on the other side. So I have my head here. I'm gonna go all the way down to the deformation palette here. I'm just gonna do a, actually no, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna go to the geometry palette and go to the modified topology area and now do a mirror and weld. And the mirror and weld since I think 2019, um, it's no longer just gonna go right to left. So it's gonna look at whatever side is on this side, has geometry, and then it's gonna go to the other one. So if I have this part here and a mirror and weld, you see it's gonna do that way. If it's on the other side and I do mirror and weld, it's gonna go that way. So this was a nice kind of thing because before the mirror and weld would always happen from this side of the mesh to the other side of the mesh. So it would happen from the right side to the left side. And so if you had stuff over here and you click mirror and weld, it'd be like, hey, you don't have anything to mirror. So now it's gonna check and if there's geometry, um, no geometry on the other side, it's gonna do the inverse. So now I've got both those parts there. For the next bar here, I'm just gonna come through and append in another one of my trusty cubes. And we're gonna move this up. We're gonna scale this like that, move this over. And for these, I'm just doing intersecting geometry. Um, I can use the Boolean option after this is done, and this is gonna come through and weld all these together. Um, but in terms of just creation, the creation process on this, and even just unwrapping, keeping these separate uh, for me is a little bit faster at this stage because I can still manipulate these shapes. I'm not going in and doing heavy modeling. Like you saw, like these are just cubes and then I'm applying um, different dynamic tessellation to them. So if I don't like it, I need to change the design. I'm not redoing a ton of amount of work. So I've got this part here. Uh, this one uh, you can see is sitting like this. I'm going to uh, remove some of these edges. So I'm gonna go to insert start moving these. Another fast way you can move edges uh, occasionally, if you come to the edge loop option here, there is a delete loops. 
Uh, this is really handy if you bring in one of the primitive cylinders and you know the primitive cylinders has all these height edges that are all through there but you only say want the top the bottom and then you want those edges in the middle just to be one thing you can click delete loops and that will remove them really quick so instead of me going through and removing all these little loops here i can just come over here to the edge loop and delete loops and now they're gone now i want a uh a few of these through because i want to apply them bend uh through this so i'm going to come over one of these edges Hold spacebar to go in the multiple edge loops option here. And I'm gonna apply multiple edge loops and I want these to kind of go. So I'm gonna apply these out like that. And I just want a few of these. I wanna make sure that I have a nice center point. So you can see there's my center point there. Now I'm getting this bandy, banding of polygrouping happening because in my insert edge here, I had um, these alternate polygroup option down here. If you don't want that, you can say keep polygroup. I'm just gonna clear them. <laughs> so there we go, we got that part. I'm going to thin this down a little bit. And now for this, I have this little arc that's happening through here. Um, before I make that arc, I want to kind of establish these other parts here. So I'm just going to duplicate this subtool and come back and use that one again. So I just saved me a little bit of time. And now for this, I want to apply a slight bend. Now there's a few ways you could do this. I could use, say, the move brush and come in and start bending this out. I could then now, you can see as I was using the move brush, it's not going all the way through. So instead of that, I could say come over and now grab the nice, oh, let's see if I can get my move infinite depth brush. And so this would now allow me to move all those. So this is handy if you want to do this process here. Um, but what I want to do is I want this bend to be a little more precise. So I'm going to use a deformer. So I'm going to go to the Gizmo 3D have that part selected. I'm gonna click this little gear icon here. It's gonna open up this little menu in here. In here I have a bunch of primitives that are kind of like parametric primitives. So you can come there and change the settings just by grabbing one of those. Then you have a list of deformers uh, directly underneath this. I use a lot of this bend arc uh, is the one I usually end up using because it's just got a simple thing. Uh, bend curves is another one. You can set curve points and then move the curve points to bend things. Um, but for this, I just need a slight bend. So I'm gonna use the arc. Now you have a few cones through here. You can see these little cones there. So you just need to find the cone that you're looking for. You get a highlight over top of them. And it's gonna allow you to apply a bend. So you can see I can come through and apply a bend here. And depending on where you rotate this, it's gonna allow you to bend that surface in or out. And you get a little slider values on the bottom here. So you can see I've got those. So now I've just added that little bend kind of curve to my form there. If it's too much, I can adjust it just add a little bend there. So there we go. A little bend, a little bend. And now I want to accept this. So I'm going to go back to this gear icon here and hit accept. And now I have converted that part there. I'm now I'm going to move this in a little bit. And so I can determine now if I want this to be on the outer or inner. So I'm going to keep it out just like that. And then now I'm going to come through and apply this dynamic subdivision. Now you'll see here that since I'm using QGrid, I'm getting a little striations through here. Now I could go through and crease these edges and use no QGrid. Um, you just kind of need to see how the QGrid's doing, if you like it or don't like it. Um, so this angle through here isn't too harsh. So I'm not getting you know a whole lot of uh, striations on that. So I'm probably gonna leave that for right now. And then I can adjust this to make it a little bit thinner. And then now I can replicate this to the other side. Now at this stage, if I wanted to be smart, um, I could save this part also for this top here. So I come through and I can just duplicate that and then come back and use that as that top part as well. Um, so I'm gonna go to this one, make sure I got the right one selected, do that mirror and weld process. So now I got both sides like that. And now I can start generating these little guys in there. So I'm going to go back to this angle. I'm going to grab that part that I duplicated before the bend, which is this part here. I'm going to make sure it's centered, rotate 90 there, scale this down just a little bit, move this up. And this is just all just simple transformation stuff. It gives my 3D. And once again, I'm just going through and we're just going to intersect all this geometry here. Applying some Q grid here to soften that form and make it a little bit wider. A little more vertical. And then we're also going to duplicate this now. Now with the duplication, I'm going to now re rotate that and then turn on that other one so I can kind of see this. 
So I just did a duplication and then a rotation. And if I can get my eyeball icons correct there. Move this out, make this one a little bit thicker through there. I can scale this now right currently because when I did the rotation, the Gizmo 3D is staying, so that's helpful. So I'm gonna add that part there. And then I can duplicate this and then do a mirror if I wanna keep it constant, or I can come through in here and just apply a mirror and weld. Now you'll notice on the mirror and weld on this, it should be going over, let me get the right axis there. Oh, there we go, we got the wrong side. Mirror and weld will also allow you to do it on axis planes. And you see that one is not where I want it. Let's make that out. There we go. That's looking better. And then I can change my mirror weld axis to X. We get it across. And then we'll do the same on that one. And then these guys. So they're a little bit, I don't like this stuff that's happening here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna center my gizmo, but I'm gonna do it with symmetry on. So I have it over here and over here. And then I'm gonna activate local symmetry. And local symmetry is gonna apply now any of my move scalar rotation stuff based on the local mesh. So now if I have that on, it's gonna apply this. If I have this off and I do that scale, you can see they're gonna do this. So you can toggle this local symmetry and it's gonna look at just the mesh that's on that symmetrical side and then apply the say scale to that area. So this is handy for when you run into situations just like this. So I just want to scale this down, but I only want to have it on that symmetry side and not globally. So now I can move that and then position this in. So now I have it centered like that. Now for the roof part, I'm going to use that smart piece that I already made. And we're going to center that Gizmo 3D. I'm going to rotate it 90. Rotate it this way in 90. Move that sucker up. Now if I want to center it to the world, I can click uh, this little icon, this home icon here, and it's going to go right to the center axis. I can move this up, scale this out now. Now I have that part. Now I can also, at this point, you know, if I want these edges to be fatter than the middle, since this is still this low resolution mesh, I can come through and apply some masking. Center the gizmo on that and scale this down a little bit. I could also go back through and use my um, gizmo 3D, uh, or not gizmo 3D, but the bend curve uh, process as well and kind of tailor these out. But sometimes you just come in and do this quick. Use the move, a little bit of taper there, apply that dynamic. Now for the roof line, same processes again. So I'm going to append in a Q cube here, if I can get it, come on. Take this one up. This time I'm going to pull this out and then scale it down and then scale it wide. My roof line's gonna be a little bit crazy here. I'm gonna have to go in and do some fixing. And for this one, I want this thin, just tightly through there. Now I still have those center edge loops through here as well. And so what I want to do is I want to get this at the angle I want it. Um, as long as you're doing the angle, you can get this to, Gizmo 3D will stay with it. This is going to help coming through and just kind of tailoring stuff quick because Gizmo 3D is going to go. And if you apply the move scale and rotates, it's going to go along that surface of the mesh. So that's handy. I'm going to delete my edge loops. And then I'm going to manually add some back in. So we're gonna hover over poly here, multiple edge loops, add a center, and I want a little more in the center, so I'm gonna do probably about really probably that much. Oh, you wanna make sure you get that center line. And then I wanna add some on this side as well. So now I have a grid. And now at this stage I can use that bend arc controller here. I'm going to start manipulating my bend again. Let's see if I can find the right, the right cone here. Find it. Find it. So a little bit of taper like that. Accept that. Move it down. Got my post being a little bit too long. 
So I'm going to fix those. Now there's a few ways I can do this. Um, and the way I'm thinking about right now is I'm gonna come through and I'm just gonna Q mesh out this top point. So if I come across here, do Q mesh single poly, click and drag, it's gonna just remove that. And I can go back in here and now it's no longer penetrating into my board. And then I can apply that process again to just get it roughly up there like so, and then double click that on the other side. For my board here, I want to also taper this a little bit. So I'm gonna go back to the Gizmo 3D. I'm gonna use a deformer this time. I'm gonna select the parts over here and move these in and then select the parts here. This is all just selecting and masking. So I can taper that part. And for this one, I want to activate dynamic, but I don't wanna use Q-Grid on this. I want it to be flat. And I want it to actually look at the creasing. So I'm gonna crease by 45 degrees. And then now I've got that looking smooth and I can adjust my crease angle um, along with my smooth subdivisions up here to tailor that edge and make it a little bit softer. Then we can mirror and weld this to the other side, which is Z. And now we can append in our last Q cube. Move this over. You make sure you have symmetry turned off when you're doing single-sided axis translations. And we're actually gonna do it straight. Wait for it, wait for it. So you can see this process is pretty much, you know, it, at a certain point it's gonna be pretty much repetitive um, in terms of what you're doing here. So I'm just adding pieces of geometry, position them where I want them. If I need more topology in a certain area, I can now control the edge loops. So I'm gonna come through and you know, remove these and then add some in. Now, there is a option with the Z-Modeler insert multiple edge loops where you have elevation, um, but with the elevation, uh, sometimes it's gonna give you a balloon effect. So with this part here, if I start doing this, you see I'm gonna get a balloon effect, and that's not the elevation I want, right? So you have uh, some other uh, kind of things you can do with that. Um, the interactive elevation is one, um, but I usually end up just kind of pulling it out and then adding more uh, points to it or using one of those bend modifiers. Um, you could also take this down to say a single-sided polygon and then use it like that and then add thickness to it. So there's a few ways um, you can get through the uh, process there. And we're gonna remove the elevation, add those there. Switch back to that bend arc, bend that out, and then also we're gonna use the bend arc to go that way some. And then we're gonna accept that, and rotate this slightly. And we gotta get, my angles weren't right. We gotta fix that other board here in a second. There we go. And then we're gonna activate dynamic on this one. We're gonna turn Q grid off again and do it by that creasing. Clear them poly groups. And then we're gonna play with our smooth subdivisions and our, where are you at? Where are you at creasing, crease level? Soften that up. Now I'm gonna go back to this part here and I just need to adjust this. So I'm just gonna manually do this and I'm gonna do it with the move infinite depth. BM. Gotta get my hotkeys down today. I'm gonna put transparent on just so I can kind of see this. I'm gonna move these in. This is gonna be a little sloppy move through here um, because basically, oh, that's way too sloppy. That's too sloppy for me to do this the right way. We're gonna get the mask lasso. And we're gonna mask these parts. Move those in a little bit.
there'd be a lot more massaging on this. What I probably end up doing at this stage um, is I'd end up removing those uh, parts I didn't want and then uh, recreating the actual uh, structure there. But we're going with this right now so we can get to the rope. I'd probably just chop some of these edge loops off and then uh, manipulate it a little bit easier through there. And we're gonna modify this one too, if you wanna give me the selection there. There we go. Now I need to get this other side going here. So I got this, mirror and weld in the Z this time. The other side there. This one, I want to fix the other side, so I'm just gonna get rid of that one. Control W that, mirror weld in the Z. Now those are the same. And then this part as well, what I wanna do is I wanna mirror weld in the Z. Bring that out. And then these guys are a little bit small now, so we need to fix that. So we're gonna mask the bottom. I'm just gonna use the move brush to pull that up. And then these guys are also a little thin. So I want to center on those, scale those out a little bit. Now at this stage I could trim these. Um, I can move these out a little bit more. There's a bunch of ways you can kind of tweak this form here. I just kind of wanted to butt in to the surface there. So I'm just gonna change that. And then for this post part, we're gonna have a very tall fountain here. Scale these down, move them up. Try to make them not look as crazy messy. Oh man, this well, this well is looking, we got, we got a very tiny well. We're gonna, we have to, I have to play with this. This is, this is too much, it's too much. Um, so once again, uh, I've got symmetry on and off for this, and so I'm moving it to the outer edges, locking that, and this is going to allow me to move those out. And another thing we can do with this is, so right now I've got these multiple subtools um, through here, and let's say I want to, you know, reposition all of them together. So for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the pizza boxes in the Gizmo 3D. So I'm going to activate the Gizmo 3D. I'm going to activate this transpose all selected subtools. I'm going to use control and shift to select part of this, but then I'm going to flip it. Oh, if I get this uh, like that. And now I'm going to make sure I have one of these kind of parts selected here. Let's do this again. And now I have just these subtools. This is multiple subtools right here. So you can see I'm moving multiple subtools, and it's all because I have this transpose all selected subtool option on. And so I know that my part here is a little bit thin through there. So I can now use this to scale all those subtools up um, at the same time. And this can allow me to adjust the form of all those subtools rather than coming through and kind of messing with individual ones. And then I can come through and tailor these guys if I need to. So I'm gonna move those in. I'm just gonna key mesh that down. Oh man, topology all over the place. Topology. Look at all this mess. Who modeled this thing? <laughs> All right, sticking with that. I got, I got a little, there we go. All right, so there we go. There we got the base there. Let's see <laughs> if there's any uh, questions here. So we got a question if there's any plans on making some kind of low polygon texture painting. So as always, I would love some low polygon texture painting. It's on my list. So we'll, we'll have to see. We're always in development, always in development. So to center the transform gizmo into form mode. So basically when you're into the form mode, the gizmo is gonna be where it is. So you have to get out to kind of uh, center it there. Um, when you're using it just normally, uh, you can unlock it and you can hold alt 
This will also do this kind of recentering positioning. So Alt and click will snap the gizmo to it. And so it's gonna do this kind of process through here. And then if you click this, it's gonna to go to the Unmasked Mesh Center. There's also a hotkey for go to Unmasked Mesh Center uh, that lives uh, over here in masking. And so that's gonna do the same thing as this little icon here. So you can hotkey it. And then if you have something masked and you wanna to go to the Unmasked Mesh Center, you can do that um, as well. Uh, so there's little tricks for it, um, but when you're in the, say, deformation palette and using any of these here, um, you're not really going to be able to reset it in there. So you want to make sure it's set before you get in there. All right, so now my well has got this, and I want to add this little post through here. So one thing with the post, it's just another cylinder object. So I'm going to come up here and append in a cylinder. And I think I might have killed my... We'll have to do a, a normal cylinder 3D. We'll have to manipulate it. So rotate it 90. Remove that up. Oh, come on now, Gizmo. Come on now, Gizmo. Scaling. Scaling. Now for the post here, if you think of it just as a simple form, you have one long cylinder that's going through, and then you've got these kind of round forms that are in there. And then this little taper handle is pretty easy just to extrude out of it. So I'm going to first go through and uh, kind of make this little brace uh, through here. And so I'm just going to apply one of these cylinder objects here. And this is going to be kind of our base kind of starting form for this. Now with this, you'll see I started with a primitive this time. So we talked about earlier removing those edge loops. So I don't want all these edge loops through here. I just want this standard form. So I'm going to come through here and go to that geometry edge loop. And I'm going to do this delete loops. And you see it's going to remove all that mess through there. So that's more what I want out of this shape. Now for this one, I'm gonna use uh, dynamic subdivision well, so I want it soft. You can see this is very harsh through there. Um, instead of using Q-grid, because I don't want those harsh angles, I'm actually gonna cut in lines this time. And to do this, I have two ways to kind of process this. The first way is I can just use the bevel, which is gonna give me two edges for one. Um, so I'm gonna get out of um, here, and I'm gonna come across one of these edges, use bevel, and the edge loop complete and just add that bevel there. So instead of me adding an edge, adding an edge, and then removing, I can just bevel, and it's gonna give me that. And I can apply this on the same way. So now I have this kind of soft cylinder. I wanna add edge loops in the middle too, so this is gonna help after I apply the smoothing, so I'm not gonna get as much pinch. So I'm gonna come over here and come across this, and do an insert single edge loop, and just add one here. I'm not too concerned about this matching um, for the shape, so I'm just gonna add another one over there. After I have this set, I'm now going to crease these guys. So I'm just going to edge loop complete, crease, 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 and then apply my dynamic. So there I have that little part. And now I can move that and bump it up to my wood there. I can replicate this now. So you can see I have these ones that are kind of holding onto the wood through here. So I'm going to hold down control and move one over there. Um, I'm not using mirroring on this because I kind of just want it to be more organic in nature. So I'm just going to position a few of these guys like that. Maybe this one wants to be a little bit wider. So you can just have some more organic nature to that form. I want one as that center part where the rope would connect to too. So I'm going to hold control and move that in the middle. This one I want to be a little bit bigger. So I'm going to scale it up. And then I'm also going to make it a little bit thinner and just have it positioned there my center there. Now, next thing I want to add is the rod going through. So basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to duplicate off this cylinder again. So I'm going to hold control and this is going to duplicate that unmasked portion. This is all still in the same subtool. After it's duplicated off, I now want to make a new subtool out of this. So I'm going to go to the tool subtool split. And in here is a split to unmasked points. I'm going to click this. It's going to take the unmasked section and now give me a new tool or new subtool rather. So now I have a new subtool there that's just that pipe. And now with this one, I can come through and now manipulate this to my liking. So I can extend that out. Um, you can see it's a little bit too big, so I'm gonna scale it down. And I just activated solo to kind of just separate it from it. If I center it to the mesh, I can get this back here. I can also center this back to the world if I wanna make sure it's directly in the center. So in the macro, you have some zero options here. So I wanna zero it back to X and do that. And now it's gonna be at the center. And so now I can extend that out from there, scale this up and down. Now, if you want to be super crazy um, and you want to make, say, 
a hole that actually looks like a hole. So these are just kind of um, ram through just using intersecting geometry. But let's say I want to take this part and I want to make a hole, you know, in one of these, make it in one of these shapes, but have it so it's actual hole. So you can actually have a hole going through something. So one trick you can do with that is if you come across your surface of your mesh, is so it like this? Let me just hide these guys here. And I want to make that ring, but I want the ring to actually have a hole in it so it looks like this post is actually going through the hole. So I'm gonna come over here and just add some uh, edge loops. So I'm gonna add one edge loop here. And if you have a really long piece of geometry, um, this is why oftentimes I'll go through and just make middle points on things, because you can see how the edge is all the way across. So it's sometimes hard to select an edge if it's really, really long in your scene. So if you add just a simple, say, mirror and weld on this, um, which is gonna give me a center point, um, now it's gonna be a little bit easier to come through and select that edge. You can also use that disabling as we were talking about earlier. So I'm gonna add one edge here, and I'm gonna add another edge here. And this is gonna be that band, but I want that band to fit snugly around this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold down uh, spacebar over one of these edges. I'm gonna go to polygroup and give this a new polygroup through there. Oops. If my alt key wants to uh, work with me here, let me select the right action. And I'm just giving that a new polygroup. Now we talked about this earlier, how you can break parts off and you can do that with QMesh and then using the shift option. Uh, the repeat last is just a click. Uh, so if, if you want to repeat the last action you've done, um, you can just click and it'll do it at that same level. So I'm going to QMesh this polygroup right here. So I'm going to do this as polygroup all. And as I'm doing this, I want to create a duplicate of this surface here. So as I click, I'm going to hold down control and this is going to split it off. So you can see this is splitting this off to a new part. Now you'll notice when I split this off, the old one's still there, but now I have this kind of ring going around. So what I can do now is I can add thickness to this part by just coming across this polygroup again. You may want to add a new polygroup to it. So if you're doing this and you hold down control, if you tap alt, you can give a new polygroup to that area you're extracting. So this saves you just a few seconds of time here. So I can pull that off, QMesh that again, and now I have this created. So I've created that surface, extracted it out, as a new part and then use QMesh to give it a solid shape again. And then now it's a hole now that's framing that other cylinder. And then now I could come in and say, add my bevels like this, and then add my creasing and do whatever I wanna do. But now I have a true to life hole that's actually going around that post. Now let's say you have the opposite as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and polygroup this to uh, Auto groups. So now I have every geometry challenge getting a new polygroup, which is easy. Now I can separate this ring from this post. And so for this, I'm just gonna do that and I'm going to split hidden this time just so I can get this off as a new tool here. So here's my ring. And so let's say I have the inverse. Say I made these holes and now I want a pipe to go through it. So same process again and come through here. I can polygroup this inner loop, give it a different color can now hit QMesh. As I drag this out, I'm gonna hold down Control. This is now gonna give me this, right? And now at this stage, if I wanna make a double loop, you know, it's pretty easy to make a, a double loop through here. Um, but let's say I wanna make this now a cylinder shape. So as I extract that out, you can see this part is flipped. So we're gonna apply, we're gonna hold Control and Shift and select it. And now I'm just gonna flip it down here in our display properties. So it gets it back to that positive side. And now that this is at a positive side, I can now come through and now use that close convex hole or a concave hole and fill that in and fill this other side in. And now I have that post kind of generated out. Now, if I did this correctly and didn't get any elevation on this surface here like this, I can now use QMesh or extrude with that flat island. Where are you flat island? I know you're in here. I already have it selected. And now I can extrude that out. And now I can make that my shape. So that's another way you can do it um, if you wanna make a hole or you have a hole and you wanna make the opposite. And then you come through and clear those out. We got some crazy taper because I got intensity. So little thing there, create the opposite process if you want. 
So let's get back to the well. All right, we went on a tangent. Let's delete that. All right, so we got this, we got my posts. I want this area to be a little bit tapered through here. So I'm gonna to go to my cylinder object here and I'm gonna mask this unmasked part right through there. Use that gizmo 3D and select it. I'm just gonna do this a little bit through there. I'm gonna flip my masking and then kind of expand out the other one. So I want this to be kind of like a little bit of a, a bow through there. So there we have that. Now for my edge piece, this little handle right here, this is pretty easy to create. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come and append in a, another cylinder shape. And I forgot I cleared my other one. So we're gonna manipulate a primitive again. So move it up, rotate it 90, move it over here. I'm gonna set this a little bit smaller. Move it so it's framing my post. This post is gonna be a little bit bigger. Let's fix that quick. And if you ever wanted to say, add a cylinder directly onto a spot. So you can see right here, I'm not directly in the center of that tube. So I could eyeball this. If I know that I have these centered to the world, I can use these options here and I can center an X and then center in a Z and Y. And then now I can move that over and it would, you know, line up where it needs to go. But let's say you have a part that's off in space. Um, but that part does have a center point. So this is one thing we talked about earlier about closing a uh, cylinder off so it's quad faced, right? But if you have that center point, you can use it to your advantage with snapping. Um, so as an example of this, with my rod here, you see I have this nice center point. So let's say I wanna make this handle piece right here and I want it to come directly from the center. So what I can do is I can go to an insert mesh brush, which is the insert uh, primitives, the IMM primitives right here. And you have two of these, one is half primitives and one is primitives. So these ones have an open surface and they can be used with uh, mesh fusion to kind of cap holes. Um, and we talked about earlier, you know, capping the holes of cylinders too, you can use mesh fusion on that. Um, you can use those H primitives for those. And so I'm gonna select this IMM primitive brush here. And in here I have a bunch of different ones so I'm gonna select uh, one of these cylinders. So we have the way to select them up here, I can press M. Um, so we have cylinders, no edges, cylinder inner loop, and I want the inner loop one. I'm gonna grab that. Now with this selected, um, you'll notice with the Simon Primitives brush, as I hover over mesh, you see it's gonna highlight those points, okay? And this is gonna allow me to perform a snap as I drag this out. So before I just duplicated the object and I moved it, but if it's off in space somewhere and I can't get to that center point, um, I'm not gonna be able to get that cylinder exactly where I want it on this piece. So if I come through and use this IMM primitives brush, I can now generate the cylinder and it's gonna generate right at the center of that mesh. Now you'll see here that my mesh vanished when I drew this out and that's because it's solo active. So if you ever have that happen, um, just make sure you're not in solo. So I can hide all my parts here. And now as I draw this out, you're gonna see that the cylinder part is coming right off that point. And if you hold down shift, it's gonna lock it into an axis. And now I've inserted this and it's directly centered off that point I added. So this is now precisely aligned with that other cylinder. So now that I have this part, I can now split this to unmasked points. And so now I have my tube and this. And now this one, I can now scale. And as long as I don't move it off that axis, it's now gonna be aligned perfectly to that post, right? So I come through and I've got this. Now for this little taper angle that's going through here, all I need to do is get to my post here. And I just need to mask half of this off and then perform an extrude. And I can do that with the Gizmo 3D. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm first just gonna mask. I wanna make sure I get the center point as I'm doing this. So there is something like that. And then I'm gonna switch to the Gizmo 3D. I wanna hold down control and I wanna click and drag. And you see it's gonna give me this kind of extrude process. Now, if you don't grab the right points, as I just did, um, you can see it's not gonna to work to your advantage. So I'm gonna switch over here back to the mask pen here, which is gonna give me a square mask. And now, dang, edge loop in there. It's killing me. We're gonna get this. We're gonna get this. Wait for it, wait for it. It's this extra loop. I'm gonna delete that extra loop here in a second. All right. And 
We're deleting the loop. <laughs> it's killing me. I'm going to delete that loop and then delete this loop. There we go. All right, now I can select this appropriately. And now if I click and drag this, you see it's going to give me this extrude process. And that is what I want. All right, <laughs> let's try this again. So I masked my points. And now I'm going to hold control and extrude, and this is the shape I'm gonna get. So I took this cylinder, I've extruded this out, and now I've got this as my object. So it's taken those points and extruded out, and I have this nice straight line through here. So this is an easy shape, and it's a fun shape to create and add some details to your meshes as well. Um, so definitely like things like this, just think of it as just a cylinder, you're masking part of it, and you're extruding it out, and then you're getting the result there. Now with this, you can also add edge loops around your corners here. So another thing, if you want to add some beveling to this shape as well, you can add these really easy. Um, for this shape here, it's thick at the top and small at the bottom. So I'm going to mask that bottom part, uh, put the gizmo 3D down there and just scale this, right? Now you'll notice when I scale this, um, that it's gonna scale, you know, uniformly, right? So it's scaling everything, right? So I don't want this to be like tapered through here. I want this to be straight. So after I have this scaling to my liking for how I want this secondary handle to kind of appear on my well here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate the side. I'm gonna use those clip brushes again to kind of straighten this up. So I'm gonna come to the clip brush and I'm just gonna drag this out and then align it here. And remember, it's going to clip to where that angle is. So there I've gone through and clipped that. Now I can center my Gizmo 3D, I can widen that back up if needed. I can now check it to the position of my point here. I can also now, since I did these with these center points, if I want this Gizmo 3D to come and scale from this point, I can hold Alt and click and it's going to snap the Gizmo 3D right there. So Alt is going to move it. And if you click and then hold Shift, it should align it. So now my Gizmo 3D is snapped there. So now when I scale, it's going to keep this radius around there and it's going to scale everything else. So this is going to still keep this part aligned to that other one. So you see now I'm getting that result. And then I can come down and move this if I want it longer or shorter. Now if I get back to my scene here, so I've got that handle there. I'm gonna get rid of this guy. Actually, we're gonna use him as a handle. So for the handle process, I'm just moving this cylinder there. I could use that insert mesh again and get it to snap exactly where I want it to go. This one I'm just gonna eyeball. So the woodworker was uh, Woodworker, the well, the old well here, he wasn't a one for quality. He just does what he does. <laughs> but it's, I got that angle. I don't want that angle. There we go. Woodworker has some stuff there. So there we got my handle there. Now, if I want to join these together, I can select this one and I can just merge it down. Give them both of them. I can now solo this, come in set my Gizmo 3D off of that point. So now when I rotate with the Gizmo 3D, it's gonna rotate from there. And this now I can add, you know, a little bit of turn to that handle there so it's not as straight. And then I can apply my creasing if I need to. So I increase by 45 there, use my dynamic subdivisions, apply my smooth subdivisions, and then I can also play with my crease level if I wanna add a little bit of beveling to that part. Wow, that handle got wonky really quick. I don't know what happened there. It was such a nice handle. Let's fix this. <laughs> this is where most of my time is spent. It's spent um, fixing, fixing stuff that I end up doing. There we go. All right. So now I've got one more part for this well here, and that is the rope. And so the rope, um, basically the easiest way to think about these things is think of it as a primitive. What kind of primitive is this and how can I make this quickly? So I could go through and try to get a curve brush and manually wrap it around this thing. That's gonna take a while. Um, I could take Z-spheres and I could wrap them around them, then trace the Z-spheres with a curve. That's gonna take a while. So. What I want to do is I want to see, well, does ZBrush have any primitives that I can use that's going to speed up this process? And so what we have in our thing here, if we come to the top, is we have this Helix 3D tool. 
And this Helix 3D is basically a coiled rope, right? So it's a coil. So I can take this and use this as my basis for creating this rope for the well. So I'm gonna select that primitive and it's gonna come in like this. Now with any of the objects inside ZBrush that have this 3D after them, oh my gosh, many of them killing me. So all these 3Ds, any of these, have a menu inside of ZBrush that's called an initialize menu. And in this initialize menu, you can change the settings of this object. So any of these are 3D objects here have an initialize menu. Well, except for the Polymesh 3D. Um, but all the other ones do. And so these are ZBrush primitives. And so with this, with this Helix 3D, if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, in the initialize tab here, instead of having Q grids, right, you've got different things you can mess with the profile of this object. So I can adjust these sliders over here, so I can change the coverage. It's gonna make this rope tighter. Um, I can adjust the profile on this. It's gonna change the inner profile of that dimension. I can adjust the thickness of this. It's gonna change how thick or how thin this is. And so you can come through and you start manipulating these curves. So this radius one is determining this offset through here, right? So I want this to be straight, so I'm gonna hit reset. Um, this is gonna take it and make it a cone because basically it's looking at this gradient ramp. I can adjust my graph through here by just clicking and dragging. And in here you can also tailor things for this graph as well. So one thing, if you wanna add a point, you just click on the graph, it's gonna add it. Um, if you click and drag, you're gonna be able to move it. You can see as I'm changing this graph, I have this circle, and this is basically the fall off of this point. So if I have one of these and I move it, I can change the fall off of it, and that's gonna determine how hard or soft that point is. All these points right now that I have, as I click on them, you can see they're giving me a soft transition. If I want a hard transition, all I need to do is drag off the curve and drag back on, and it's gonna change how that point is gonna transition. So I can do that process again. So let's say I want this to be a hard transition, not this soft edge anymore. So click on the point, drag off, drag back on, and it's gonna change it now to be harsh. So any of the graphs inside of ZBrush, you can manipulate using that process, and just drag off, drag on, is gonna determine if they're hard points or soft points. And then to get rid of them, you just drag them off, um, and they'll go away. So for the rope, I want this to be all the same thickness all the way through, I don't want this taper. So I'm just gonna crank my graph 100% to the top and the bottom, and that's gonna give me that. Um, the Z offset, you can play with that too, it's gonna to determine how much or how thin this thing is. Um, we can adjust my twists and my divides. So with this, what I'm gonna do when I'm done with it is I'm gonna apply that dynamic subdivision to it. So I don't need you know, tons of striations uh, across the horizontal axis here, so I can turn these down. Uh, generally, what I end up doing if I do anything cylindrical, I usually use uh, powers of eight, so I use four, eight, 16, 32. Those are usually ones I end up go to. Um, if I'm making a specific shape, sometimes I will have to use six and 12, um, but I try to keep them in uh, eight, 16, or 32. And that's gonna give me this kind of coiled shape here. Uh, the divide here is gonna determine how many divisions it's on. Since we're using dynamic subdivision again, I don't need a crazy amount. Um, just enough so it's not looking crazy tessellated along the side. So you can play with this um, until you get what you want. Coverage is gonna determine how much this is. And then the thickness, I'm gonna modify this as well. So I want this to be constant. And you can just kinda play with this. So I want it thick where they're touching, but I don't want it to be crazy thick through there. And you can also do some different things with your um, profile as well. So as you change this, you can adjust offsets and strength um, and it'll modify these things too. So you have a bunch of uh, different things you can do with that to determine your forms. So I'm gonna crank that up and then we're gonna change this something like that. So I'm just gonna modify these settings here until I get my rope looking how I want it here. So I want some offset, where's my Z offset? There we go, coverage. And this will allow you to you know, figure out um, how many coils of this rope you want. So that's looks like a pretty decent amount for this well. And if you adjust this, you can also get them to you know, come a little bit closer. Um, if you're doing a bake for this, you probably just wanna end up you know, making a cylinder object eventually and then just engulfing it. So you probably want these to touch a little bit in bed so you don't get like ray casts through the center of that, so you can make that as tight or as slender as you want.
After you're happy with this, we can go up to the tool palette. I'm going to do Make Poly Mesh 3D. And now I've taken this and changed it from that initialized object to now this Poly Mesh 3D object. So if I go back down to the tool palette and open up the initialized palette here, you can see those initialized settings are gone. Uh, so we got a question quick on the initializing. So the initialized settings, um, so they are, they will live on any object that has a 3D after them in your 3D meshes here, except for the poly mesh 3D star. So if I come across any of these, so any of these with the name and then 3D, so if I say come in and go to say the ring 3D object here, this is a primitive object. So it is not a poly mesh 3D object, it is a primitive. And if it is a primitive, if you go to the tool palette and go to the initialize area, you'll have controls in which you can modify that shape. So with the cylinder here, I can come through and modify these, change the divides, change the twist, change the coverage. And that is just because I selected in the 3D meshes here, a primitive 3D object. Now, if I choose a poly mesh, like that poly mesh 3D star, or had one of the objects I've already been messing with, um, when you select this, you'll see the initialize menu is only gonna give you Q grid, or Q cube, Q sphere, and Q grid. And so that's how you can kind of tell if, hey, I'm in a poly mesh object, or hey, I'm in a primitive. If your initialize menu has just these options here, you have a poly mesh 3D object. If you have other options, you have a primitive. And so you just can come up, select any of these primitives with the 3D option in them, and then that initialize menu should open up. Let me know if that answers that. I'm looking through these uh, questions here. So I have a question from James asking if that multi subtool select is enabled. And if you have multiple subtools selected and dynameshed, would they dynamesh together? So the multiple subtool that I use to move the, say the whole of my uh, thing here is in the Gizmo 3D. So if I go to move, you're gonna get the Gizmo 3D right here. And there's a little icon here that's called transpose all selected subtools. And when you enable this, this is now going to give you that multiple select. And to select objects, basically all you need to do is use the control shift option. So if you have the select rectangle selected, just like you do with say polygroup visibility, um, but this time you're working across multiple subtools. So if I come across and drag a box and release, oh, make sure I'm in my Gizmo 3D here and release, um, you're gonna see that any area that's getting this hatch lined is unselected and anything that's not hatch lined is selected. And now if you move, scale, or rotate, all those subtools are gonna be affected. Now this doesn't affect anything else. So if you're in this mode and you have these pizza boxes or the transpose all selected subtools enabled, this is going to only affect the subtools and your only options for changing those multiple subtools are move, scale, and rotate. So if you dynamesh this, it's only gonna dynamesh the subtool you have selected. So you'd have to merge those objects together and then apply the dynamesh. And then if you have a dynamesh option um, in here and you have this groups option on, it will retain those groups. If you have that off, it's gonna merge it all together when you dynamesh. So I'm not sure if that fully answers that question, James. James had a question about using this and then if he used dynamesh while this was active, would it keep those parts separate? So all this is doing is allowing you to move multiple subtools together. And so you can move, scale, and rotate. You're not gonna be able to do any other processes um, with that. And then you can use the control and shift to select which subtools are going. Um, you can also use the uh, folder options to select subtools as well. So there's an option in the folders where you can do transpose set, and it'll do the same process. But it's just the pizza box icon here. So if you're just having, you know, sitting at home, eating one pizza alone, moving one subtool, you just want one pizza, but if you're gonna have a bunch of people over, you're gonna have a party, you wanna make sure you have at least three pizzas. And then that'll allow you to move multiple subtools. And that's just with the Gizmo 3D. All right, so now let's go back to my, my well here. And let's now add that rope primitive in here. So I've made this helix, and now I've converted it to a poly mesh 3D, and now I wanna append it to my scene. So I'm going to go over to the subtool palette, I'm going to click Append, 
I'm gonna grab the PolyMesh 3D version so you can see it's added PM3D to it. I now have that rope here in my scene here. I'm now gonna take this, move it, rotate it, and I'm gonna scale it to fit where it needs to go. Now, one thing with my well here is that I want the rope to, you know, it's wrapping around, but I want it to go in the well as well, right? So I want to make it look like it's doing this. So I'm going to hide some of my parts here so I can see this. So maybe these guys here. And then let's just get the rope and my post. So there's my rope and there's my post. Now, what I want to do is I want to rotate my rope so it's this face here, or this end, is pointing downwards. So I'm gonna take this and rotate it, and it should be around 90, and you see now I have this rope feeding down. Now I wanna make sure I have this on the correct side there, so uh, this part I'm just gonna have it embedded, like it's feeding into that thing, it's holding it on so that it's not slipping out, and then this part is exposed. Now at this stage I have a few options I can do here. So I have a flat surface here, so what I can do is I can hover over this, go to that Q mesh and do flat island. And I can now click and drag and pull this out. And so now I'm getting that rope coming out of that surface there. Now this is good right through here. So I could drag this out again. I can now use my insert multi meshes. And this is gonna give me a nice straight line. Now if I wanna modify this, I can come in with say the move brush and add you know, a little deformities to that. I can switch to my uh, ooh, my, my hotkeys are, are jumping around here. My infinite depth, and that's gonna give me a little more control over it. I can add some more points and do that. Uh, the other thing I can do is I can use that bridge hole option again, right? So after I've made this, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to split this right here, add another edge loop, and then I'm going to give this a polygroup. So now I have this as a polygroup and this is a polygroup. I'm gonna remove this part through here, so I'm gonna Select that polygroup, select this polygroup, and now I just have that little base area. I'm gonna invert my selection by holding Control and Shift and dragging off. And now I'm gonna to go to Geometry, Modify Topology, and I'm just gonna do a Delete Hidden. So now I have a hole and a hole. Now I can take this part, put my Gizmo 3D on it. Let's make sure I actually got it selected. And I can position this somewhere in my well. So let's bring my well back here. And we're gonna move this down, maybe move it over here, maybe move it a little more in the center. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm giving ZBrush a point of reference to go, hey, I want you to bridge from this point and bridge down here. And I'm gonna make a curve in between it to have it look a little bit better. Um, and so I'm just setting that endpoint. So this is the same thing I was doing at the beginning where I broke that part off and now I can make a nice bend. So this is helpful, you know, in just making quick curves, right? So I'm gonna isolate that part there. I've got two open holes here. Go back to my Z modeler brush. I'm gonna hover over one of these edges and I'm gonna select bridge two holes. We're gonna do, yeah, we'll try spline, see how that goes. And now I'm gonna click one of these edges right there. And I'm gonna go up to this top one, click that second edge, wait for it. And I didn't click it. Let's try that again. We're gonna click this first edge. And once again, you can disable those parts. And then as this is going, I can now add a little curve in there, add some tessellation. So now I've got something like this. <laughs> May not be the exact loop we're looking for, but you can kind of see how you can kind of get that process going and make this rope um, look the way it is. And so you can end up, you know, doing whatever kind of curve you want on that. So the, my initial uh, one I selected may not have been the, the choice there. So we're gonna try, let's try arcs in line. So select one, select the other, click and drag. That looks a little bit better. So now we got my rope going in my well. Now I can apply my dynamic subdivisions. So I have a taper on the top and the taper on the bottom for that closed holes. So I can apply creasing to those and get them at 45. So that's gonna give those a nice hard edge. And then I can apply my dynamic subdivision. There we have my rope there. And then I can bring everything back. And there we have our well. So there we go. I got through the well.
<laughs> All right. So we'll get questions quick, and then I think that is it for this stream. So I've got notes for next time. Um, I'll definitely cover over the uh, UV stuff and some of the uh, Maya and Morph targets and then the poly painting stuff for next thing. And also pass along this information to uh, Solomon and Paul as well, and they may be able to cover it in their streams um, before I get to it. Uh, let's see here. So we have a question from Brack. He's asking, uh, how can I scope without affecting the inner shell of my subtool? In other words, how can I make the inner shell and outer shell stay parallel through the sculpting? Tried without back fake masking and I still get similar results. So for that, it's gonna be tricky. Um, you can mask that surface, uh, but if you have something really thin and your brush is really big, uh, when you sculpt, even with back fake masking on, it may actually go through that surface. Um, so the movement from the depth is gonna be one way to do it. Um, the other option, is basically um, you can use the extrusion processes so you can sculpt just the outside edge and then generate thickness through extraction. Um, if it's low polygon, you can then use you know, the Q mesh option to give it thickness. Um, but basically you're gonna have to protect the one side from the other. But say for like cape sculpting, what I'll end up doing is I'll sculpt the cape flat on a single sided piece of geometry and then use say the project uh, or the extract option here and extract it out to give it thickness or you can also use um, in the morph area down here, uh, there's a crate difference mesh, um, which will allow you to take your cape, store one morph target here, move it in space where you want it, you can scale it, do whatever you want, and then create the difference between this morph target of that cape and the other one, and then you get a new piece of geometry. Um, so that's, I'll do that often, especially for like cape sculpting and stuff, just to get it to uh, work. Yeah, but it's, it's going to be based on your thinness of your mesh. So if it's really thin, even with back face masking, you still may end up sculpting through that mesh and applying the other side. So the, for merging tools, um, so say you want to take this and merge it all together, um, you could use DynaMesh for that. So I can come through here and say merge. Actually, I want to, well, I could use the live Boolean on this one um, and select it. And then Boolean, since I have a lot of, uh, subdivision surfaces here. Probably want to turn that on and then make Boolean mesh. If I wasn't going to Boolean it this way, um, I need to, if I merged it, my dynamic, the Q grid and the, um, that's actually a good point. Um, so when you merge objects together, if you're using dynamic and Q grid, um, you're going to want to make sure that you merge Q grid with Q grid and merge dynamic with dynamic. So if you have cylinder objects that are using just dynamic and no Q grid, if you merge those things together, you want to make sure you only merge those ones. Because if you merge a Q grid one with a dynamic one, then that dynamic smoothing is going to change the look of that mesh. Um, I, don't, I don't really have time to, to go through the demonstration on this, but basically, if you use Q grid, keep it with the Q grid meshes, and if you use the dynamic without Q grid, keep it with those meshes, because it's going to change how the, your edges are going to look on those models when you apply that stuff. So for this model here, um, I used the boolean on this um, to get my result and I applied the dynamic subdivisions to it. So this took account that, hey, this one was using uh, just dynamic, and these were using Q-Grid, and it's applying it all at the right way and then performing the Boolean operation. So this is now all one solid uh, piece of geometry. So if I come through and start smoothing this out, you can see this is all merged together. And I just used the Boolean uh, to get this all one solid mesh. So at this stage, you come through and print this out, um, it's good to go, as long as you don't have stuff floating all over. But I think I got most of the stuff embedded. Um, if you're using, if you have this stuff merged together too, so if I just do this, I'm not gonna do this the correct way. Um, I'm just gonna merge visible on this. And here's my merged version of this. So you see when they merge this together, all my dynamics uh, turned off. And then if I apply these again, since I had Q grid and um, non-Q grid surfaces, uh, you'll see how this works you'll see that some of these areas aren't gonna look the same. So you wanna make sure if you have, say, like these two here. So this was Q grid, this was Q grid, all these were Q grid. And then these were using dynamic with no Q grid, so they look okay. Um, but then now, since I merged them together, they're looking different. And then if I turn Q grid on, you see now it's gonna mess up these guys. So you wanna make sure if you, <laughs> you gotta keep your dynamic subdivision and dynamic Q grid in different subtools, especially if you're applying them. 
So going back to the Gizmo 3D, um, this is a quick question here we had. Um, on using these, in here you have remesh by uh, Dynamesh, remesh by Union, remesh by Zero Mesher, and remesh by Decimation. Uh, the Dynamesh one is just going to perform a Dynamesh process. So it's going to be the same thing that you can do by just going to the Dynamesh tab. The one benefit of this one is that you're going to get a polygon count slider um, there that's going to allow you to set how many polygons you want. So if I remesh this by Dynamesh, I'm going to get this up, um, find the cone here for this, which is this one here. If you have over this, you can kind of see it. Let's see if I can get to see it any better. My white subtool here is... Uh, Blocking it. it says target polygon count and in here you can drag this out and this is going to change your target polygon count and when you release it's now going to dynamesh. So that's one benefit of using the Gizmo 3D dynamesh option is that it has a target polygon count slider built in so you can do that and then dynamesh off of it. Um, the other ones that you have in the Gizmo 3D remesh by union is going to do the boolean process on it. So if you have a subtool that has a whole bunch of intersecting parts, remesh by union, use the deformer one, it's going to weld it all together, make it all nice. Then you can apply Dynamesh later if you want. So these are just little different ways to kind of use the Boolean union, use the Z-Remesher, use Decimation Master, and use Remesh by Dynamesh. I'll mainly go in here and use these if I have a subtool that has multiple parts. That's when I end up using these. Um, if I have something broken down like this um, well part here, I'll usually use, say, the, you know, for the Boolean process, I'll use this option through here. Um, or I'll merge them all together in Dynamesh through there. So just little different options there. Uh, we have a question, one more question here. Can a model with a normal map details be imported into ZBrush? So you can import in the model and you can import in the normal map. You will not be able to see the normal map inside of ZBrush. It'll just come in as a texture. PLUV is still in development. Uh, there's, I think I've done quite a few uh, on dynamic subdivision. Um, you try searching the you know, Z Classroom for dynamic server subdivision stuff. And then also if you just do ask ZBrush dynamic, um, you'll probably find some stuff there. There's a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm, I have a, also there's a uh, webinar um, that I did a while ago that's all on Z Modeler and there's a lot of dynamic stuff in there. I cover a lot of the dynamic subdivision, I think, at the start of that, and then go into using ZModeler. And that one has some of the similar stuff that we covered today in this one. Um, I also go into more of the uh, kind of aligning and moving stuff around and use, generating stuff flat and then using thickness to uh, get the shapes you want. All right, guys. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this will be uh, restreamed as well, so uh, you'll be able to catch back on as long as you don't have any technical difficulties. You'll be able to rewatch this if you missed anything and tune back in. Um, once again, for Kyle here, let's just uh, give him a shout out for this as well. Uh, so we have a survey that is up, and uh, one in Kyle is wants to make sure you guys uh, check this out. So please, if you have two minutes, if you guys can fill this out and tell us what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see on our live streams, um, fill that survey out. Kyle will be extremely happy. Also, in the bottom of my screen here, we have Solomon. We'll be streaming on March 5th at 11 a.m. PST. And then finally, the uh, MPC film, The Lion King, the presentation that we had at this year's ZBrush Summit. Um, it has finally been approved for public viewing. So if you came to the summit, um, you could only see it live on site. Um, so we now have gotten approval to stream this out. So you can see the uh, URL right there. You can go check that out and watch that presentation. So thank you guys. And uh, <laughs> the Avengers are doing well, doing well. The heart's, heart's still kicking. So uh, hopefully uh, end game is done. We'll see. We'll see. You never know when I'm on call. Always on call. All right, thank you guys, and uh, stay tuned for some additional stream. I think today we got some uh, other streamers on Friday and uh, Tuesday. We got some coming up. So thank you all. Have a good day. Happy ZBrushing.